Hi, I'm Jose Hoglar from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. I'm the chair of the writing committee for the 2023 guideline on the diagnosis and management of atrial fibrillation. I'm here with the co-chair of the guideline, Mina Chong from the Cleveland Clinic. We are very excited to let you know about the release of this guideline. We want you guys to take a look at it. Mina, what do you, what do you like? What are you excited about this new document? Oh, this was a, a from scratch redo of, uh, the, of the atrial fibrillation management guidelines. So there's a, there are a lot of new uh, pieces in there. And one of the things that we want to highlight is that we came up with a new staging or categorization system for atrial fibrillation that goes beyond just categorizing AFib as paroxysmal to persistent or longstanding persistent. And it acknowledges the complexity of atrial fibrillation going from prior to development of atrial fibrillation through the various stages, including uh, paroxysmal, persistent, longstanding persistent, atrial fibrillation ablated, um, uh, ablation, uh, ablated atrial fib, and, um, and allows us to actually use that as a framework for our recommendations for therapies. I agree. I think I think that we need to change the way we think about AFib. I think AFib is more than just a rhythm abnormality, but it's a complex disease, a reflection of a complex substrate, thus a more holistic approach to patient care, multidisciplinary approach that takes into consideration things like risk factors, lifestyle. And those, you know, we're providing these guidelines, very prescriptive recommendations, so I'm very happy about that. Um, personally, I also like um, the concept of early intervention. We're also trying to change the dialogue here, trying to change with this guideline how physicians perceive this disease and try to intervene earlier, refer the patients earlier. What do you think about that? Yes, uh, there, there have been lots of data that have been generated recently with randomized uh, controlled mm -hmm. trials looking at early treatment of atrial fibrillation, early rhythm uh, control. So that is certainly incorporated into mm -hmm. the guideline and uh, not just with um, ablation, but also antiretic drug therapy. And I think this is a, a paradigm shift from older days where there was more emphasis on, on medications and antiretic drugs. Not that they don't have their place, but um, this, there's a lot of new data out there that we incorporated. I'm, I'm hoping that the medical community takes a look at, at this guideline, and um, I'm hoping that we provided all the tools needed for the clinician to take care of patients with atrial fibrillation. There's a lot of good stuff on this guideline. There's there's, um, we cover uh, recommendation for catheter ablation, which is abs actually an upgrade compared to prior guideline. We cover anticoagulation drugs and a lot of miscellaneous issues like um, anticoagulation in patients with device detected AFib, et cetera, et cetera. Any comments? Mm. Yeah, the anticoagulation is also another big change uh, with the risk scoring systems that traditionally mm -hmm. we've uh, all used CHADS2 VASC. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the guideline uh, acknowledges that that there are limitations to, CHAD, to CHADS2 VASC mm -hmm. and that there are other um, risk scores and there may be situations in the gray zone area in the lower CHADS uh, fast scores where shared decision making and use of uh, other uh, other risk scoring systems and and incorporation of other factors that may include uh, you know, a, a, many other clinical factors that influence stroke risk. Mm -hmm. So it really uh, incorporates more of a concept of uh, thromboembolic or stroke risk annual stroke risk per year. So there's some additional nuance added in the guidelines. Yeah, I like that. I like nuance uh, allows the physicians to expand on the way they, they have conversations with the patients. Uh, you know, there are some cases that are very clear cut, but some cases not so much. 
and we try to provide the tools for those uh, those situations as well. So I'm I'm pretty happy about these guidelines. I want I want to encourage the public to take a look at them. But let me also thank the writing committee members for the hard work and dedication. This uh, guideline was created by a very solid group of hardworking experts from across the planet, I would say. But especially, I also want to thank the staff of the Joint Committee, HAACC Joint Committee on Clinical Practice Guidelines, especially Sabrina Singleton Times, which was our staff assigned to this guideline, worked so hard to take this project to fruition. So thank you so much to all of you. And please, to the public, take a look at these guidelines. I hope you enjoy them. If we make a mistake, we'll have a chance to correct them because moving forward, we hope to evolve this guideline, edit it, update it on a more frequent basis. So thank you so much and please enjoy the document. Yeah, thank you very much.